upgrade to my computer. And welcome to the October 2020 Planetarians webinar. Today, we have, by popular demand, Chris Reed presenting about uh, using images and videos in your planetarium legally. I say back by popular demand because he gave gave a seminar a bit over a year ago, actually, um, which was uh, using music in your planetarium legally. And that one is recorded in our, in our planetarium seminar archive. Um, so uh, just a reminder, remember to stay muted while you're listening. But if you do have a question, unmute. Make, remember to unmute if you want to ask your question or type it in the chat. I'll be looking at the chat like a hawk. Um, so with that, I think I will hand it over to Chris Reed. Chris. All right. Thanks very much, Alan. And, and thank you to PPA for hosting this. And thank you all for, for joining. Um, I, I heard we have somebody on from France. So thank you for uh, staying up uh, for us. And, and thank you to those of us on, or to those of you on the East Coast who are um, putting off your happy hour for another hour or so uh, while you sit and listen to me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have some slides I'd like to walk through. And could you just confirm that that's coming through for everybody? Looks good. Great. Thank you very much. So um, as Alan mentioned, our topic today is, is using images and videos in your planetary legally. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, I did a presentation on a similar topic about using music in a planetarium uh, about a year ago, which is hard to imagine it was, it was that long. Um, for those of you who are in that one or who have watched that uh, on, on YouTube, this will, will look similar at the beginning. We're going to talk about the basics of copyright and then get into some of the specifics um, of the sources of images that are, are generally fairly safe. We'll talk about some of the areas we want to watch out for. Um, I did just want to mention, because I because it sounds like we do have at least one person uh, from international audience uh, with us, and, and that is that this is mostly rooted in US law and US sources of images. Um, I can tell you generally that the copyright law is, the basics are more or less harmonized around the world, although there are some, some areas where it may differ. Um, and that actually brings me to, um, here we go. Um, it, it wouldn't be a legal presentation without a disclaimer, and I don't want to dis disappoint anybody, so we'll start with that at the beginning. Um, although I am a lawyer, I'm, I'm not your lawyer. Uh, these are sort of general remarks about the state of the law and that you should remember to talk to your own counsel if you have particular questions about specific use cases. Why that relates to the international uh, piece is just, I was about to say, if you are international, um, you should especially talk to your own local counsel because the rules may well be very different. We'll talk a little bit about some specific limitations and exceptions. For example, uh, in US copyright law, one that you've all probably heard of before called fair use, that is very unique to US law. So you wanna just keep that in mind, especially if you're coming in uh, from an international, uh, you know, from overseas. Um, also related to this are, you know, I may make some comments about things that seem fairly low risk or fairly high risk. Um, that's sort of my assessment as a lawyer. Um, and your own lawyer may have a different perspective on that, right? So law lawyering is basically um, a game of managing risk and figuring out how much risk you want to take on. Um, and different lawyers uh, have entirely reasonable different interpretations of that sometimes. So that's another reason why you want to talk to your own lawyer um, before making any particular decisions. So my goal here is to present you with some, you know, sort of the broad outlines of the law that pertains to this area and give you some suggestions. Um, but when you get down to specifics, you really should consult your own counsel. <laughs> Um, I just, some of you, I, I know I've, I'm looking at the list here. I've, I've met some of you before, many of you um, I, I have not met. So I just wanted to give you some quick background. I, I feel like something of an imposter uh, among the, the other attendees here because I'm, I'm actually not a planetarian and have not worked in a planetarium officially. Um, I was obsessed with the planetarium business when I was a teenager and started hanging around them. Uh, I grew up in, in Colorado. So I spent a lot of time at, at Gates and at Fisk uh, in my local school district planetarium. Uh, Jefferson County Public Schools. Uh, I just became sort of obsessed with not just the the you know the astronomy, but if, but actually how planetariums operate and, and sort of the, the business and economics of that industry and, and how all the pieces fit together. Um, had always wanted to work in media. Had always wanted to be a lawyer. And so over the years, I sort of figured out ways to put that together, and that's how I'm coming to you today. So my day job is I, I work. I'm a lawyer for a large media and entertainment company here in Los Angeles. 
Uh, I started at that company about seven years ago or so, um, coming from the US Copyright Office in Washington, where I was a senior advisor to the director of the agency on a variety of policy and operational issues concerning the Copyright Office. And before that, I was a litigator at the Justice Department in the uh, Antitrust Division. So I worked um, in working primarily on media and entertainment cases and uh, things relating to copyright there. So my whole career has really been very focused on kind of copyright, media, um, you know, production law, that sort of thing. Um, and some of you, I think I've talked to in this context from about two, two, uh, 2005 to 2009, I wrote the general counsel column for the, the Planetarium, which was trying to bring some of these issues together. And for me, it was another way of combining all these interests uh, uh, together as well. So um, Alan and I have, have each already sort of highlighted this, but just to, to recap what we're going to talk about, I'll start with the copy, copyright basics. So fundamentally, when we're talking about using images and videos in your planetarium, what we're really talking about is getting the proper rights to do that. And those rights stem from copyright law. So we'll talk about the basics of copyright law, um, what rights are at play, um, what types of copyrighted works are we talking about and in the parlance of copyright law. I'll then move on to applying those to the planetarium environment. So we'll, we'll talk specifically about what is it we're trying to do uh, within the planetarium. And then we'll look at some legal options for using images uh, and videos. As uh, Alan and I each mentioned, we can leave some time for questions at the end, but I'm happy to take them as we go along. So please feel free to, to um, you know, present those in any way, uh, as Alan described earlier, the, the chat, the raise hand, or, or just shout them out um, as, as we go along. <clears throat> Okay, so as I mentioned, what I'd like to start with is kind of the basic subject matter of copyright, right? Start right at the very beginning. And copyright fundamentally seems very simple. It is, it protects, it is a legal right that gives authors and creators of original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression, certain exclusive rights, right? So the basic kind of fundamental foundational principle here is we're only talking about original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So in copyright, what original means is that it originated with an author. And we use the term author in copyright to mean anyone who created a creative work. So when we're talking about photos and videos, we're really talking about the photographer, the videographer um, in more elaborate videos. It might be you know, the director, the producer, various people that had creative input into the work. Original doesn't mean that it is 100% wholly unique. So if Alan and I are hiking together and we both see a really cool scene, and we each take a picture of it, and those pictures look very similar. Um, I'm not infringing his copyright. He's not infringing my copyright. Those are two separate works that we independently created, but we can both claim a copyright. So it's a little bit different than patent law in that way. You may have encountered um, conversations or, or read things about patent law. For patents, they have to be 100% wholly original. Nobody else has done it before. That's not what copyright's about. It just means orig originality just means it hasn't been copied from somebody. And then fixation just means that it's, you know, the technical term is that it's fixed for a period of more than transitory duration. Um, that's an overly technical way of saying it basically has to last long enough that you can exploit the work in some way um, that we'll talk about here in a minute. So you get certain rights with a copyright if you're the copyright owner. And this more than a, a period of transitory duration basically means that the work subsists long enough that you can exploit one or more of those rights. So the example I often use for this is a sandcastle, right? Sandcastle on the beach might be an elaborate, you, know, you might build this amazingly elaborate structure, but you couldn't claim a copyright in that as like a work of art or a sculpture, even though you, you could claim sculptural protection for that if it were in fact like a, you know, a freestanding sculpture, but because it's in the sand, the tide's gonna come in and wash it away. It doesn't last for more than a period of transitory duration and therefore is not entitled to copyright protection. Chris. Yes. If it's a video of the sandcastle though. Yes you would have, that's right, you would have protection in the video, right? So, and, and because there's additional creative input that goes into creating that videotape work or video, you know, recorded work in some way. So that's exactly right. So, and that gets me to actually the next slide. So thank you for the segue. This is um, what, you know, that original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression is very generic. Um, in one of the rare moments of Congress being useful, they have provided us with a list in the Copyright Act of what that actually means. So there are these categories of protected works that are defined by statute in the Copyright Act. And you can see them there, I won't read them to you. We're concerned about a couple specific ones. So in the presentation that we talked about earlier about music, we were concerned about musical works. Um, and then down at the bottom, you see sound recordings. Today, we are worried about two different categories, pictorial, graphical, and sculptural works, which you see there fourth from the bottom. Um, and also motion pictures and other audiovisual works, right? So those are the categories that we're talking about today. 
So let's say you have one of those, that's a copyrighted work. What does that mean? What can you do with that? And you remember a second ago, I said, well, there's these certain exclusive rights that a copyright owner gets. Here they are on your screen now. A copyright owner has the exclusive right during the period of copyright protection to reproduce, prepare derivatives, distribute, publicly perform, publicly display, and in, in, for sound recordings, there's a special rule. So what this means is only the copyright owner or somebody that the copyright owner has authorized to engage in these behaviors can do this, right? So reproduction is very simple. That is the basis of copyright law, right? Is the right to copy. If I write a book, the only person that's authorized to make a copy of that book is me, or I can authorize other people to do it. And that's what a publishing contract is. If I write a book and then I give it to, you know, Harper Collins and Harper Collins um, goes and prints it, they're doing that under a license agreement with me, or they might have bought the work from me, right? So they, they then have that copyright. The point is only the copyright owner can engage in these things. Most of these are self-explanatory. Um, I'll just spend a second on preparing derivative works. That um, is, you know, the, the easiest sort of textbook example of that is um, a, a book that's converted into a movie that's, that's produced into a movie. That movie is a derivative of the book, right? Uh, it might be a translation. Um, it might be an adaptation. Uh, a lot of times people, if anyone's familiar with fan fiction, where people take sort of the world that's built by a, an author or a, or a TV show or something, and then they write their own stories. Technically, those are derivative works of the original uh, of the original work. And if you're going to commercialize them, you would want to have permission from the, um, the original uh, author or owner of the copyright film studio or the TV studio or what have you. Um, public performance and display is where we're going to spend some time later. So we'll talk about those uh, within that, that context, because that's obviously something we do in the, the planetarium environment. Um, what can happen if you infringe a copyright? And, and I should mention, I'm going through these very, very quickly. This copyright is a full, you know, it's a full semester course in law school. And I'm just giving you the very, the, the very highlights. And so if anybody wants to know more about this, please contact me afterwards. I can give you some resources for, for where you can get more into the basics of copyright. Um, but if you unlawfully or without permission of the copyright owner engage in um, certain of those uh, uh, protected, um, uh, th those exploitative categories I talked about a moment ago, um, you are in violation of the law unless what you're doing falls into a limitation or exception to copyright. So let me just pause for a second and explain the structure of copyright law in the US. And, and this is true mostly around the world as well. The first part of, of the copyright law, you know, the first 100 pages or so, deals with granting rights to authors. So that's the stuff we just went through very quickly, right? So it is, you know, what types of works, what types of rights, and under what conditions you can, you can exercise those rights. The next part of the act, the Copyright Act, and again, global copyright statutes, take some of those away, right? And we call those limitations and exceptions. And the reason we have limitations and exceptions is because copyright is fundamentally about speech, right? It's about expression. It's about expressing oneself or, or a company's views, or it's, it's about creative work being expressed in some way. And that in the United States tends to run up against the First Amendment, right? We wanna make sure it's another value of, of our legal system um, in our society that people have the ability to engage in productive speech that enriches the public good. And the concern with copyright is if you lock down all the speech, there won't be anything left for people, for, for other people to use. And I'm, that's, I'm being deliberately hyperbolic with that, but that's the general principle. And so that's why there are limits to copyright law, because the idea, if I could, for example, prevent somebody from writing an editorial um, or, or writing a review about my book, um, and, and I prevented them from quoting my book, it would shut down speech that's critical, potentially critical of me or critical of my book and our free speech doctrine say that that's the sort of speech we want to encourage. So that's why there's limitations and exceptions to copyright law. So we'll get into the limitations and exceptions in a minute, but I just wanted you to understand sort of the broad, the broad construct. So if your conduct falls into one of the categories that was on my prior slide, it doesn't fall in, it's not exempted by a limitation or exception to copyright law, and you don't have permission of the copyright owner, you can run a, you, you can be an infringer. And that's, uh, you know, that's, it's illegal. Um, there are two ways that that gets handled in the United States. Um, and one of them, we've all probably seen this at the beginning of, of um, it's a very dated reference now, but you know, home movies. So at the beginning of, of videos that we would buy of commercially released films and the DVDs and Blu-rays um, have this warning from the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security on them that says you could go to prison and have to pay a lot of money if you, if you infringe. And that's not wrong, although that's not the usual course, right? So that's a criminal enforcement of copyright law, which is possible. The far more likely result of an infringement is an injunction against the unlicensed use. So that's where a court basically issues an order to say, stop engaging in that unlawful use. 
and then money damages, right? And so, and this is where people tend to get a little nervous because the numbers are really, really high, right? So money damages awards in copyright, civil copyright enforcement can range anywhere from $750 on the low end to up to $30,000 on the high end. But if the infringement is found to be willful and the standard for that's really low, so most infringements are, are you're able to find that they're willful, can be as high as $150,000 per work infringed. And so this is just you know, uh, going back, if anyone remembers back when Napster was, was in its heyday, right? That was a service that allowed people to download music onto their hard drives from other people's hard drives. Um, and it just became this sort of free for all on the music industry. One of the things that scared people engaged in that business was that they could have been responsible for infringement damages of up to $150,000 per work. Right. And so when you think about the number of works that were being distributed on a platform like that, you could quickly get into the tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's why infringement damages, sometimes when you read about infringement cases, that's why the damages are so high. It's because they're dealing with a lot of works that, um, that, that you end up at the top end of the, the damages spectrum. Having said that, um, most judgments that I've seen, most copyright cases settle early. So we don't have a lot of evidence of, of what um, what damages tend to, to look like, but many of the cases I've seen outside of the really egregious ones are far less than $150,000. So you just be aware that's the cap and that's why this, that's why we should take copyright uh, very seriously. Um, but it's also not as you know, scary as sometimes we see like those, the slide I showed you before with the $250,000 and the five years in prison. That's for criminal infringement, uh, which you see there at the bottom. Um, that's, that's for extremely egregious and, and extremely egregious uh, infringement and it's done for a, um, a commercial purpose, right? You have to have some sort of commercial motive involved to get, to get into the criminal realm. And then a quick note about duration. This is the, the piece of copyright everyone loves to hate. It's often blamed on Mickey Mouse and Disney uh, for why copyright is so long. And that's, that's really only part of the story, but co copyright was extended. It has been extended over time. Originally in the United States, copyright lasted um, 14 years. Um, and then it became 28 years, and then there was various renewal options. Um, and, and over time, it has expanded. And currently, the life of a copyright is the life of the author, plus an additional 70 years. And then in cases where you have what we call works for hire, um, or works that are prepared by a company, um, or pseudonymous works, or anonymous works, they last 95 years. The copyright on those lasts for 95 years after the first publication, or 120 years after the work was created whichever expires first. Um, I always have to look these up. I know the life plus 70 pretty well, but I always forget the other ones. Um, the bottom line is it's a long time. And most things are, uh, you, you can rest assured in most cases that things are protected by copyright. Um, for, for a variety of reasons that are very complicated to explain. And, and I don't, I always, again, always have to look these up. Certain things that were in the public domain got, uh, the copyright to those got extended a number of years ago. And so as a result of that, the um, anything before 1925 now is considered public domain. But then anything after that is potentially still in copyright. And then we have to go and look at what the law was at the time the work was published or created and you know whether certain formalities were followed and whether something was protected or not. So duration gets very, very complicated very quickly, but the clean line is pre-1925, it's in the public domain and no longer protected by copyright. After that, it becomes more complicated to figure out. Okay, so those are the basics of copyright. Again, whirlwind tour of the Copyright Act. What I wanna do now is transition into how do you actually use these, how do you use the works and the rights in um, within a, a planetarium. And so I took three kind of use cases, right? One is you're using images in planetarium shows, projecting them on the dome in the theater. The other is in exhibits, right? That, that surround the, the, the planetarium theater. You might be, but, but on-premise exhibits. And then the third are use cases. So both of those are um, exploited. Well, let me, let me do this. What you're doing to put it into copyright parlance is you're taking pictorial, graphical, and sculptural works, which is one of the enumerated categories of protected works, and or motion pictures or other audiovisual works, one of the other technical categories. And then the rights that we're worried about here, the rights we're concerned about, are public display or performance, because right? we're either displaying them in exhibits or performing them on, on the dome in the case of video. Um, we might want to prepare derivative works. So that means we want to take something and put it into one of our own shows or put it into some other context. So we might need derivative rights. Um, and then reproduction in the case of, I wasn't going to go too far in this, but if you're, if you're producing shows for distribution, for example, um, you're distributing them to other, other facilities, you would want a right of reproduction and a right of distribution as well. 
Um, and, and we'll see in a minute that, you know, a lot of times when we talk about terms of, of licensing, um, that those get separated out and that if you want, you know, you, you, it's one license to do something within your planetarium and then you need an additional license if you want to distribute it um, elsewhere. It, it either costs more money or you just need additional permission. But this is sort of the, what we've done is taken copyright law, looked at it broadly, and now we're narrowing it. These are the things um, that we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about. So that's this, just to orient ourselves um, within the broader context of copyright law. So quick reminder on, on music for a second, because I just, for those of you who, who have either watched that seminar or, or read anything that I've written or other lawyers have written about copyright uh, in music, you know it's enormously complicated because we, you may, for every song, you might have two separate rights at issue. Right. You might you have the musical work and the sound recording. Those are often owned by two different people. And so the licensing landscape for, for music is extraordinarily complicated. Unfortunately, in this environment with images and video, we don't need to worry about that because almost always the rights, in, the rights we need for videos and images are owned by one party. Right? So it's usually the photographer, the videographer, or their employer. So it's much, it's much more straightforward. Whereas in music, we have all those, you know, the ASCAP and BMI organizations that represent publishers, and then you have the record labels that, rep that are, you know, own the masters. It just it gets enormously complicated. Images and video are complicated for some other reasons, but fortunately it's not this. So we don't need to worry about that um, to the extent that that was on your mind. I just wanted to kind of clarify the, the you know, what, what we're talking about here is a little more straightforward. So let's make this a little more practical and talk more specifically about what are, what are our options? Like where might we find or how do we navigate the rights that we need uh, for images and videos we want to use in our, our facilities? Um, and, and the first is, seems obvious, but I thought it was necessary to mention, um, create your own images. So when you create your own images or create your own videos or commission somebody to make them and you, you draft the contract properly, you own those from the beginning. And the reason I said, just to caveat that, the reason I said when you draft the contract properly is that for independent contractors, they, the, the default rule is that they own the copyright unless you get it assigned to you in, in an agreement. So uh, versus if you're an employee of an enterprise, a, a company or an organization, the company, and you, you are performing the work within the scope of your employment, the company or organization owns the copyright. So if I, uh, so good example, you know, I mentioned I, I wrote the general counsel column for a while for, for IPS. Um, when I would write those, I would own the copyright in them, and then I was basically licensing IPS to print them, but there was never a formal assignment of copyright to IPS. So the copyright remained with me, and IPS had the right to print them. Right? Versus if IPS had hired me as an employee and said, your job is to write articles for us, every article I wrote under that employment arrangement would have been owned by IPS. So that's um, just keep that in mind when you're commissioning things. And that's almost a whole other topic is sort of how to draft agreements to make sure you're capturing those rights. But just keep that in mind that when you're creating, you're creating your own stuff is a clean way to own the copyright if the, if the contract's been negotiated the right way. So that's, that's item one. That's probably the simplest, easiest way to use you know, copyright cleared images. Uh, next on our list is using old images that are in the public domain. We highlighted this a minute ago. Um, works that were published before 1925 are in the public domain, those you can use. There are some databases floating around out there that, that purport to maintain you know, only public domain works. I know the Library of Congress, uh, the Prints and Photographs Division there has a, a fairly large archive that they have done their best to identify uh, when things were published to help guide you. One thing you'll find with a lot of those databases, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, is that they're not making any representations or warranties that their research is accurate. And so the risk you run when you do that is that they might be wrong. And it turns out that that, was actually, that photo was actually published in 1927 and the estate of whomever took it is still around and they now wanna get paid, right? So there's some risk in doing that. But um, that's again, like I said at the top, a lot of what we do is risk management and it may be that in a particular circumstance, that's a risk that you're willing to take based on the type of, of use that you're engaged in. Um, and I'll talk more in a minute about databases that purport to have images or videos that are ready and, and clear for use. Uh, so our third option is to license something from a reputable source. And I'm sort of, that's what I'm getting at when I say reputable source is we want to make sure that whatever representations they're making, they're going to either stand by them or that we think they're reasonably accurate. Because again, this is sort of a game in risk management. And then the fourth and final kind of broad category of ways we can do this is by relying on an exception or a limitation. And this is where you really want to get the advice of your own counsel. Uh, because that's it's making a judgment call as to whether your particular use or engagement fits within um, the statutory text. So that's actually what I'm going to talk about first is a couple different, um, really three different exceptions to copyright that we might be able to rely on 
when we're trying to use images in the planetarium. Um, and, and the first is this, and this is really US specific at this point, this particular one, um, US government works. So works that are prepared by employees of the United States government in their official capacity are not protected by copyright. And that is right there in the statute. This, what you're seeing on your screen is a, uh, is a quote from the law. And the rationale for that is that we, the taxpayers paid for that, uh, that work to be, to be prepared. And so the government does not claim copyright in it. Um, you'll see at the bottom there though, that the, or in the second half, the United States government is not precluded from receiving and holding copyrights transferred to it. So there are situations where somebody will prepare something for the government and then assign the copyright to them. So the copyright, because they were a contractor, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but because they were a contractor, they own the copyright, and then it's assigned to the government. The government technically then does own the copyright, and it becomes a question of whether they were going to enforce it or not. Again, sort of a risk management question. And where Chris, this comes up, Chris, yes. Uh, does that apply for people using things in foreign countries? Using? Yes. So, well, it. so do you mean works of foreign countries? Like if the you know, German government does something. Um, not, not necessarily. And this is where I, my knowledge is, is um, unfortunately primarily US focused. Some countries have similar doctrines. Some countries, I think it's more common that, that most countries claim a copyright and then grant broad usage rights. So they say, we own the copyright in this, but you can use it for various purposes. And the sort of things that we're doing are almost always included in those because they are intended to um, to allow you know the, the taxpaying public in those various countries to engage in, in that use. But that's the sort of thing where you'd want to check with with a lawyer or check on the various websites of the agencies. You know, if it's the European Space Agency, for instance, you'd want to see what their policy is on that. My guess is they they developed a policy on what their copyright position is. So even if something is technically protected by copyright, you may still be able to use it because they basically granted you a license versus the US where there is no copyright on government works, period. Um, so where this comes up, that whole contractor thing I was talking about a minute ago is with a popular source of images in our world, which is uh, NASA and its various, um, various units, right? A lot of those are actually run by contractors. And this is where I've seen some people run into trouble. And you can see at the bottom, I've highlighted some language. Um, this is not so much videos and images. I, those actually look to be pretty, pretty clean. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But here you can see the notice at the bottom. It says the works available on the server are copyrighted. They've granted a royalty-free, non-exclusive worldwide license to the government and others acting on their behalf to use the works for government purposes. But any other form of use is subject to copyright restrictions and prior approval must be obtained from the party holding the copyright. And the reason I highlight this is because, you know, I think a lot of us, and me included for a long time, took stuff from JPL's website or, or took stuff from very, you know, from NASA websites and assumed that because it was on the website, it must be a government work and is therefore free and clear. And that's just not the case. So you wanna be very, very careful when you're using this stuff to, to figure out, kind of look at the image credit, see who actually prepared the image, um, and then look for an image use policy. And I will show you an example of that here. Um, this is STSCI. This is an example of another example of a contractor that owns a copyright in their work, but then you can see um, it was prepared under, on the second line down there, uh, prepared under certain NASA contracts unless specifically stated, no claim to copyright is being asserted by SCSCI. Any material on the site may be freely used as in the public domain in accordance with the contract. So what they're saying there is when they drafted the agreements with NASA, with the government, the although the private contractor could have taken the position that they own the copyright, they haven't. They've said they've agreed with NASA that they will make those works available as if they were works of the government. And that is the most common arrangement in government contracts. So typically the, the government gets the, get either, either there's no copyright, there's an express statement that says we are not claiming copyright protection here, or they say we're claiming copyright protection, but we're giving it to the government. And the government then is not gonna assert that copyright. So you're free from any sort of restrictions typically on those, in those situations. Most of the major reputable government agencies in the US have a policy like this that's on their website. The other thing to look for is a lot of times images and videos you might want to use are part of press kits or materials that are released to the media for the express purpose of generating publicity. And there, even if they're not expressly saying that you can use those things, um, there is a strong argument. Again, this is one of these risk management things, but there's a strong argument that what you've actually got there is an implied license. So an implied license is a legal concept that basically means by the conduct of the person who owns the rights, we're assuming that they intend to give a third party certain access to those things. 
And so this comes up all the time in various other things I've done where people freak out because images they released to the press start being used in a way they didn't want them to be used. And it's kind of like, well, but you, you released them to the press. And so now you can't be surprised that the press is using them. Um, even absent a particular agreement saying the press may use these, uh, it's sort of implied from the context, like they were on a website intended for distribution to the press. Um, you can't now complain that the press is using them. And so that happens a lot here as well. Like if you're going to incorporate something into a planetarium show um, and it was released to you on, in this context where it was obvious that that's what you wanted it for and that's what you're going to do with it, there's a strong argument to be made that notwithstanding whatever copyright protection there may be, um, you had a license to do what you did. Where you start to get into issues is with, again, with like show distribution, because that's kind of a level above, right? So using it in your own facility is one thing. There's, it's kind of, it's very clear and, and can, it's a, a more contained usage. When you start packaging that and selling it or licensing it to other people, um, I think is where a lot of rights owners would start to ask for some either additional compensation or just the ability to, to provide more guidance or more um, restrictions on how that, that work is used. Um, similar, going back to JPL for a second, similar uh, image use policy. These are just examples that I put in from some commonly referenced sites. I mean, I, I don't mean to suggest this is the universe of things you can use, but things to look for when you go to websites. And, and Alan, to your point earlier about international um, partners, I think that are international uh, government agencies. I would look to their websites to see if they have similar uh, policies and practices, because my suspicion is they do. Right? Government agencies are design are are. Uh, it is in their best interest to, pu to publicize what they're doing. And so typically they will take positions that allow you uh, fairly broad uh, access rights to their stuff, subject to whatever rights that they may have themselves. If they've hired a third party to do something, they may not have the rights to grant you um, for all of the things that you want to do. And in some cases, you may need to go back to the original rights owner. But by and large, most government agencies, at least in the US, can grant you pretty broad usage rights to use them in those three ways we've been discussing uh, in, in the planetarium. You can see here this one, JPL's image use policy. I just captured this the other day. Uh, it says, unless otherwise noted, images and video on JPL public websites uh, may be used for any purpose without prior permission, subject to special cases uh, noted below. Um, and there, I like this last line because what they're basically saying without saying it is, please don't ask us for permission because we don't have time to respond. They're basically saying, if anybody asks you if you have permission, print this page and show it to them. Um, which is a good practice, by the way. I write, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment in a, in a particular case. But whenever you use something that you don't have a specific license for, so if you have a specific license for it, you should keep that license you know, handy. But along with that, I would keep printouts of any, or you know, digital print PDFs of the websites where you captured certain assets that you may be using, images and videos, um, and a timestamped copy of the policy as it existed when you used it, just in case there's any question later. If somebody comes back to you and says, why did you, Use this image. Why did you think you could use this image? You can turn around and say, "Well, I thought I had this license by virtue of the language on your website." And the timestamp helps, you know. Just, and I, I, nothing fancy with the timestamp. Just you know, when you usually print a website, it gives the most internet browsers will give you the um, the date and time at the top or bottom of the page. Just keep that as a PDF uh, with with those assets, so that if there's any question, you'll have it ready to, to show people. Okay, so that's our first kind of government use uh, or government work exception. There's another exception in the Copyright Act, again, very specific to the United States, um, called the, it's often referred to as the Teach Act. The Teach Act is actually much broader, but this is one particular part of it. And we often hear people talk about, it's okay to use things uh, because of the education use exception. Well, there is no education use exception um, that, that doesn't exist, but there, there is this little nook and cranny of the uh, Copyright Act called the Teach Act which basically says that performance and display of a work by instructors or pupils in face-to-face -face teaching of nonprofit institutions in classrooms or similar places devoted to instruction is okay, even if you don't have a license or otherwise have permission of the copyright owner. Um, the text you see in blue is highlighted because those are the operative phrases, right? So, um, and, and you can see this is very limited. It's only performance or display. So this does not help us with, you know, show distribution or, or um, putting this, using these images in any other way other than sort of in our uh, planetarium environment. Um, where this, again, a risk management point, I would assert that a planetarium theater is face-to-face -face teaching uh, in a classroom or similar place devoted to instruction. The reason this statute is drafted this way is they were trying to protect distance education providers. And this was done, I forget when this was actually um, uh, when, when this was enacted, but it was long before kind of the modern internet and the idea of digital courses uh, that we have now and remote teaching and all the things we've had to become good at in the past six to eight months. 
Um, this was when distance education was largely kind of packaged videos that you watched and maybe sort of workbooks or, you know, PDF materials. And so what they were doing is crafting, what Congress was doing was crafting an exception that would still allow the distance education providers to protect their stuff by limiting it to classrooms or similar places devoted to instruction. And I don't know the legislative history on how that language became specifically what it is today. Um, but my suspicion is they said classroom and somebody said it needs to be broader than that. And then they got this, this add on. I would be comfortable if, if I were any of your lawyers, uh, your lawyer, I would, I would be comfortable asserting that a planetarium theater is qualifies under, under 1101 here. Um, but again, this is something where I would, before you rely on it, I would want to talk to your, if I were you, I would talk to your own council to see how they feel about that. But this is how most schools get away with not getting specific permission to show movies in classrooms, um, to you know, sing songs, things like that. It's performance, it's display um, of the copyrighted work in this uh, prescribed setting. So um, I mentioned, I wouldn't hang my hat on this outside of certain you know, limited circumstances, but I, it is out there and I wanted to make you aware of it. And also make you aware that there is no such thing as this broad education exception. It just doesn't exist. The, the other um, exception that comes up a lot that is also sometimes confused as an education use exception is fair use. Uh, another uniquely American concept. Uh, you may have seen things about this. This is often misconstrued that people think that, you know, it's fair use. If they, people think they're hard and fast rules. So it must be fair use if I take, you know, less than 10% of something, or if I change five lines, it's fair use, or I can take 10, 20 pages out of a hundred page book or whatever. And that's just not how the rule uh, is set up. The rule is set up as a balancing test among these four factors that you see on the screen. And I'm not going to read them to you, but the key thing to remember is that they're, to figure out whether something's fair use, we have to think about each particular use in context and balance these four factors. And with images and video, it's very difficult to do it because you've got this number three, the amount and substantiality of proportion used. You can't use a part of an image typically, right? You're typically trying to use a whole image. So now you're kind of dead. So that, that factor for photographs kind of gets thrown out. So now we have to think about, or not thrown out, but sort of, you know, minimized. So now we've got these other three factors. And unless you've got something that's a really clear case, um, fair use can be challenging because it is ambiguous. And the flip side of ambiguity, you know, a lot of people complain, oh, fair use is useless. It's too ambiguous. How could I ever rely on it? I still might get sued. And then, because fair use is an affirmative defense. So the way fair use works is somebody comes to you and says, you infringed my work. And you go, no, I didn't. It's a fair use. But by the time you have the opportunity to make that argument, you can make it at the, you know, when they complain to you stage. But really to know if something's fair use, a court has to say it is. And that's an expensive process, right? To get all the way to a litigated judgment where some, somebody decrees that it's fair use. And so this is where talking to lawyers is very helpful because there's been uh, you know, nearly a hundred years of jurisprudence on what fair use actually means, cases that interpret all of these four factors. And so we lawyers can sit and look at a situation and kind of say, this looks an awful lot like the type of, um, of things that have traditionally been fair use. And then maybe another use looks an awful lot like things that have not been fair use. So we can help kind of navigate that. Um, it is not true, though, that anything done for education is fair use. And, and a lot of people um, hang, there's a, there's a piece of the law that comes before these four factors that kind of sets out some examples, and one of them is teaching, um, but it is just an example, and it's not an exhaustive list either. The other, there's other, like news reporting, commentary, and criticism. Um, this is really where the rubber hits the road as far as that safety valve I talked about earlier between copyright and First Amendment values. It's fair use that kind of carries a lot of that water. So when somebody says, I'm engaging in some use of your copyrighted work, but it's for a beneficial purpose and it's, it's advancing free speech and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, it's fair use that usually they're relying on. For our purposes, it's a little tricky to rely on fair use just because, um, tip, especially with images and video, because you're usually using it to enhance something um, as opposed to, or to illustrate something as opposed to comment or criticize or engage in some commentary of the actual work. So for example, if you're just using images in a planetarium show, I don't think that's enough to consider it fair use. If you're just using them because that's a good visual to demonstrate something, I don't think that's enough. If you're using it because you're doing a piece on a segment or a, a lesson on you know, how different people might uh, colorize images differently or how two different shots of the same thing look different under different types of conditions or something like that, where the image itself or the video itself is the subject of the teaching or the commentary or the criticism, it's much, much more likely to be a fair use. 
And that's why I say it, that's kind of a narrow needle to thread, which is why I say it's the sort of thing you, you want to try to talk to a lawyer about. Also, a lot of institutions have their own fair use policies. They'll tell you sort of what you can and can't do. Um, again, the risk management layer, they've sort of gone through this analysis for a lot of common use cases, your, your lawyers, and made decisions about what your institution's um, capacity is for risk, right? Some companies and some organizations are really risk averse. Others um, are happy to take shots and see what happens. All right, and it just depends on the environment that you're in. Okay, so those are exceptions to copyright. Let's talk more about licensing. Licensing is just a fancy term for having permission to do something. So if I give you a license to use a photograph, you, it just means I've given you permission. Licenses and copyright, and that's almost a whole other seminar, but licenses and copyright can be subdivided dozens of different ways. So I might give you a license to use an image in all planetarium shows worldwide for 20 years. Or I could say you can use it in a specific planetarium show that's shown to no more than you know 60,000 people within two years uh, in the state of Michigan during you know during these three months or something like that. Right? Very very specific language. You can see them uh, cut up any which way. In entertainment, that's often what we see. That's why um, you know back this is sort of dated now given the pandemic and everything going to streaming services, but. You know, I'm sure most people on here remember when we used to have release windows in entertainment. So a movie would go to a theatrical release in a movie theater, and then it would get pulled out of that, you know, six weeks later, six to eight weeks later, then it would go away for a while, then it would show up on premium cable, then it would go away for a while, then it would show up in video stores and go away for a while. All of that, those were just different licenses, right? And being released at different windows. And the reason they could do that was because each person got a little, you know, theaters got a little slice of rights. And then, you know, uh, the home video guys got another little slice of those rights. Um, so you can carve up licenses however you want, or they can be as broad as you want, right? And so you saw like the JPL text, that's technically a license granting you permission to use those images. It was very broad. It said anything on these websites, you can generally use subject to these terms and conditions, right? So um, licenses run the gamut. And we're going to talk about a small handful of them here. The first one um, I have struck because it is mostly a joke, but you would be surprised at how many people think that this is okay. And this is the bane of photographer's existence these days. Um, we jokingly in the photography community call it a right click save as license. People think it is okay to take images off of websites and just use them. And the reason they think it's okay is because it is so easy to do. You can right click on an image and save it and it's, you have a copy of it. And so part of what we're seeing in the photography community these days, the professional photography community, is they are aggressively starting to enforce their rights because there is so much infringement going on, particularly on the internet, right? It is so easy for me to take an image from a website and upload it to Facebook and then somebody takes it off of Facebook and then puts it on their own website. And all of a sudden you've lost control of that image. And so photographers are sort of fighting back a bit. I'll talk a little bit later about um, copyright enforcement entities that some of you may have heard of. Um, they've been very aggressive at enforcing uh, image use on, on websites. But uh, the point of point one really is, you know, just because it's online doesn't mean that it's free to use, right? So just keep that in mind. I think most of you probably are well aware of that. That's why you're here, but I just wanted to, to, to mention it. Chris? Yes. Uh a uh, question popped up in the sure. uh, from Todd. Uh, I'll just read it. I am five years into a 15-year license to the show One World, One Sky from Skyscan. They just went out of business. Is the show still <clears throat> licensed? Um, it is tough to say without the license agreement, without seeing the language. Um, so that's something you'd, you'd want to run by your own, like looking at the language by your own counsel. But um, if the if the agreement says 15 years and you've got a date on it, then I would take the position that it's probably okay, um, just based on those facts alone. Like I said, I'd want to I'd want to you know you want to look more closely at, at what the agreement says. But generally speaking, that is the um, that you know the license is the license regardless of of whether the copyright owner is still in existence or not. Uh, where yeah, Alan. I can comment on that as we are the licensed distributor of that show. Uh, exactly. Yes, regardless of the status with Skyscan, those rights basically revert back uh, to us at the Adler. So yes, you are still uh, you are still permitted to carry that out to the extent of the original license. Uh, and then when your original license expires in five years, you will renegotiate with us or with one of the other distributors on the market. Perfect. And it's good to hear that there there was sort of a, that, that scenario was contemplated and the rights revert because what often happens is uh, companies will go bankrupt. This happens a lot in the music industry. Record labels or, or other players will go bankrupt. Uh, and then nobody can figure out where the, the, the ownership of the copyrights went. And this often happens, it's not just it happens once, like it happens over the years, multiple people, this, people will acquire a catalog, not properly register that. It will end up you know, going through all these different hands. 
And then at the end of the day, nobody knows who owns that work and it becomes what we call in the copyright space an orphan work, which means it is still, we know it's still protected by copyright, but we, there's nothing we can do about it because we can't talk to the original copyright owner. And because this, the risk of damages is so high, you'll remember 100, up to $150,000 per work infringed, um, people won't do anything. And so it's become a real policy issue. And if, if you're interested in that, the Copyright Office uh, has done a bunch of studies on that and proposed legislation. Uh, the legislation made it all the way through the House one year and, and kind of stopped, got stuck in the Senate. Um, but they were, they were trying to set up a regime in the US at least where you could use those after doing a good faith search to find the copyright owner. If you couldn't figure out who owned it, you could use it um, and, until you could, until a copyright owner comes forward, at which point you'd have to negotiate with them. But the copyright owner wouldn't be able at that point to say no, right? They couldn't stop you from continuing to use it. You just have to come up with some reasonable compensation for, for doing so. But in this situation that Mike just described, it sounds like that has been um, pre-negotiated. And so they've, they've figured that out. They own the right, they get the rights back, and then they're able to do deals on their own for the, you know, even though their distributor is no longer available to do that. Yep. That was in our original distribution agreement with Skyscan, which was signed yeah. way back when to give them the rights to do that. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's the one of the challenges for like a quote unquote end user is that often uh, we're not apprised of like what's going on behind the scenes. And unless something, you know, if, if a company winds up in an orderly fashion, that's usually handled. But more often than not, it's because of a bankruptcy um, or people just forget that they own rights. Because that's one of the things copyright is so broad. People often don't realize what they own. And as a result of that, and then you know, 20 years later, somebody comes along with a copy of something and says, I, I want to figure out what to do with this, and they don't know who to contact, and then you end up in that federal open work situation. So, um, all right, so uh, back to licensing. I, I'm going to then talk about a couple of specific sites that people have been lured to lately. One is called Unsplash. Um, the other is not really a site so much as a, a doctrine or a, a type of license called Creative Commons. And then we'll talk about commercial stock photo uh, libraries. And by the way, when I use the phrase photo, I'm, I'm including images or uh, videos in that as well. But the law around these is, is actually quite similar. So um, unless I call out one or the other specifically, you can assume that I'm, I'm talking about both. Um, OK, so this is a website called Unsplash that has become very popular in the past several years. And it is basically a free stock photo library, uh, which sounds very exciting. And it's pretty good. It's got a lot of really high-end images that people have contributed, and they're free to use for more or less anything. And you can see um, their license on their website says that. It's very clear. You can use the, they can download them for free. You can use them for commercial or non-commercial purposes. And you don't need permission, but they would like attribution. Um, you can't sell the photos without significant modification. Query what significant modification means, but let's put that aside for a minute. And then you can't create a competitor to Unsplash, so you can't go in with a you know and scrape all the uh, all the images off of out of Unsplash and start your own your own site. So that sounds um, pretty great. And even if an image is removed, um, you can continue to use it subject to the terms of the license uh, that was granted originally. And, and again, when I say the license, I mean what we just looked at, which is basically you can do what you want with the image. Um, that all sounds well and good. One of the challenges with Unsplash that has uh, that I have found frustrating is that is this issue that images can be removed from it. And unless you have documentation that it was originally published on Unsplash, or that's where you got it from, if somebody comes down the um, you know comes later and says that photographer either sold that image to someone else, sold the copyright to that image to someone else, or they just forgot they put it on Unsplash. Um, and then comes after you looking for, for money, you don't have any evidence that you have a license to use it. So here again is where, remember I said earlier, I suggested printing out a copy of, or you know, a screenshot of, of the license terms when you use images. Um, I cannot stress that enough on sites like this. And I'm using Unsplash because they're the biggest. There are other services out there that purport to have free, uh, free photos. Another risk of using these sites is that they're not making any representations or warranties as to um, the ownership of the image. And so we have seen some situations where people will take photos from various places that they don't own, upload them to a service like this, and then to you and me coming along as innocent users to Unsplash, we see that image and say, oh, it's on Unsplash, it must be free. But the original photographer who took that didn't actually upload it. And the person who did had no was in no position to give the rights that they purported to give to Unsplash. Uh, technically, you could go after the person that uploaded it to Unsplash. But the first rule of litigation is that you can't get blood from a stone. And so the likelihood of being able to recover from that person is pretty slim, even if somebody comes after you for infringement. So the bottom line here is I would be very careful about services that purport to have free licenses 
unless it's a reputable government agency or some you know, organization that you know and trust, because you don't necessarily know the origin of the image and nobody in the distribution chain is gonna stand behind um, those rights. So you wanna be very, very careful about that. And I'll give you, this is an example that just came up a couple of weeks ago where somebody, um, the, the Royal, uh, the, the, uh, some government agency in the UK took a photo from Unsplash, edited it and put it into an ad that some people found unsavory um, and that created this big PR backlash. And that did not create, it, it is unlikely that this creates any sort of infringement liability because the photo, nobody's disputing the photo was on Unsplash. It looked like it was properly there, um, but it was, this photo was used in an ad um, it, it, and, and it's in a way that some people find offensive. And so that created this big PR backlash, right? And so, like I said, not necessarily copyright damages, but uh, it got them into a situation they didn't want to be in. I'll use this also to mention when you're using images of people, you need to be very, very careful because if you're using it in a commercial way in the United States, you need additional permission from the person who's in the image. So the general rule, we're talking primarily about copyright. And copyright is a right that attaches to the person who creates the work. So if I'm a photographer and I'm taking a picture of let's say a, you know, the stands at a sporting event, um, I own a copyright in that picture. If you wanna use that image in the newspaper to talk about um, to, to talk about the, the, the sporting event, that's fine. You don't need to get permission from the people because that's what we call an editorial use. It's illustrating something that happened. If, however, I want to use that photo in an ad to try to sell tickets to the next sporting event, that becomes a commercial use and I need permission from the people that are in the image because you can't, that's a, it's a doctrine called right of publicity. We all, in most states in the United States, we all have our own right of publicity. Uh, we all own our own right of publicity. So that we can't, you, they, you can't use somebody's voice, name, like, likeness, image um, to promote a product or service or to promote um, engaging in some commercial transaction without permission of that person. Right? And I see somebody in the chat made a comment about using music in political rallies. This is exactly one of the arguments they make um, because often those the, those performances are it, it is just a public performance of of a, a musical work. And so if the venue where that's being performed is covered by an ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC license, they're covered on the copyright side. So the argument for the, the argument is they're covered on the copyright side. So they have to make a right of publicity argument to say, I, as the artist, have no desire to be associated with you, the politician. Um, that's, a, that's effectively a commercial use because you're trying to encourage somebody to do something. It's not a commercial, like we're not selling you know, a product, but we're selling that candidate as a, as a political person. So that's exactly kind of what's going on in that situation. So again, a, these unsplash things, I think they're risky just because we're not clear on where they come from and there may be other rights issues lurking there that we're not, we're not clear about. Next level up is this concept of creative commons where we see it's, and I would, I would say these are a little safer to use but they still present similar risks. And they have a similar kind of setup. You can go to the, to the creative commons website and they have what is basically a stock photo library of images that are licensed under a series of um, of specific Creative Commons licenses. And that is exactly what they are. It is a series of, of um, uh, prefabricated license terms that mean certain things. And you can see them there on the left under that license or public domain. Um, they call it CC0, which is public domain. And then anything under that, those are various forms of licenses. So it's not that the, there is no copyright. It's that they're granting licenses subject to terms that Creative Commons has set up and they've given a kind of a name to, a brand to. And then it just makes it easier to say, oh yes, this is Creative Commons, share alike, whatever license. And I, just to give you a, you know, a, a flavor, there's dozens of them, but just to give you a sense of what they look like, this is kind of the, what they call the license deed or the, the little snapshot of what each license means. If you click on um, view license code, you'll get the full um, license language that only a lawyer could love. And that will actually explain sort of what rights are included and what, what aren't, although the, the um, uh, the, the plain English statement does a pretty good job of explaining that as well. And you can see this is an image I stole from somewhere else, but it is licensed, as you can see in the upper right, under a Creative Commons license. And so it was uh, it was acceptable for me to use it for this purpose. But this sort of summarizes the key license terms relate to whether you have to provide attribution, whether you can create derivatives, whether you have to provide downstream users with the same rights that you took, and whether it can only be used for or whether it can be used for commercial or non-commercial uses. One thing I wanna highlight here about the share alike piece, what makes that tricky for us is if we're including a Creative Commons um, image or video into a planetarium show, for instance, under the license term, if it's a share alike license under Creative Commons, it requires that we then 
grant a share alike license to anybody downstream for the planetarium show. And where that gets tricky is we may not have those rights to give, right? So we may, it may be okay for that particular image, but let's say also in our planetarium show, we have 20 seconds of footage we licensed from um, a, a Hollywood studio, right? You're only gonna have the right to use that in your show unless you've negotiated for rights to distribute that to other people. And so it creates this, it, it's a little bit of a challenge uh, for these share alike licenses because you may not have those rights to give. And you don't wanna be an infringer by purporting to grant those rights to somebody else when you don't actually have them. So my concern about Creative Commons is the same as my concern about Unsplash, which is it's very easy to designate something as Creative Commons when it actually isn't. And these are examples from Flickr's upload screen and they're a little dated now. I don't think Flickr's upload screen looks like this. But the point is, I've, def I have had cases with photographers who uh, my client has used an image um, thinking it was Creative Commons. The photographer comes forward and says, no, it isn't. And then we show them where it was designated as Creative Commons. And they say, well, I didn't upload it there. So it's the same issue as you have with Unsplash. Um, I, I have seen cases where people take images from Facebook or Twitter or you know, name your social media platform and then upload them to a service and designate them as public domain or one of these um, these licenses, that makes it very, uh, very dangerous to rely on them. Uh, because again, Creative Commons is very nice in that it creates for us a standard kind of lexicon to use. Like it's easy, rather than drafting licenses, we can just say, oh, this is Creative Commons, you know, whatever. And we know what that means because we can go look it up. Um, but it does not guarantee that those images are owned by the people that are purporting to grant the license or that that image is actually supposed to be distributed in that way. Um, and they're not going to stand like Creative Commons is not going to be there for you if you get sued over using that image. So just something again, I'm not saying don't use these. Um, I'm just saying be aware that that's a risk that exists. So an example of where Creative Commons licenses are really, really useful is in concert with a concept we talked about earlier, which was that government use, um, that government works exception. So here we can see the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has, has been um, trying to, to step up its game on distributing assets to, um, to people like the planetarium and provide or organizations like Planetaria and allow them to use the, their image assets uh, that they have put online subject to this media use policy. And you will see that this media use policy, a few things I wanna highlight here actually, um, is, is there's some terms. So those are easy to, under, to read and understand. I'll highlight a few of those here in a second. But it also says there in that first full paragraph um, that it is under the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 unported license. And there's a link to it there. So what they're saying here is that you can use these um, however you like, subject to the terms of that license, as long as you also follow the terms that are set forth in this website. So this is a situation where I would trust the rights that I'm getting from Creative Commons because I know that that license was granted by a reputable source, right? I trust NSF, I trust the uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, um, and I, I trust that if I follow these rules, they're not gonna come after me. A few things I just wanted to highlight here, um, and actually one of them I already talked about, that second, uh, well, the first, let's start with the, the first bullet there that I've, that's in the red box. They disclaim any liability arising from the use of those images. Rem keep that disclaimer in mind because I'm going to talk about the flip side of that here in a second. Um, second one is if the image or video includes an identifiable person uh, and it might violate the right of privacy, you have to get separate permission. We already talked about that. So there, um, technically from a legal perspective, like I said, you really only need that permission if you're going to use the image in a commercial context. Um, but what they're saying here is if you want to use that image from us, you have to get that permission no matter what. So that's then it's a term of this license, not just the law. It's become part of the license agreement that you've made by using their images. Um, and then there's this addition, this language about narrated videos um, that, are, that are offered for the express purpose of incorporation into new works may be reproduced only in their entirety. This I just highlighted because it's, it's certainly not unreasonable, but it's a common sort of thing we see if certain people grant you, certain enterprises grant you a license to use something that's sort of pre-formulated, a lot of times you don't have the right to edit it. So you can use it as is, but you can't chop it up. And often that is because, and I don't know that that's the case here, but often that is because whatever contracts were involved in them producing that original show required that those components or that show, that, that video or, or whatever they're, they're licensing you, that had to be in, to remain intact. It's part of the deal. So again, a Hollywood example, often agreements with directors and actors and producers say that the studio will not edit the film in any kind of material way. The directors, um, you know, once the director and the studio agree on the final cut of the film, that's that. The studio is not going to go and release different versions of it. They don't have the right to do that. So that's sort of what's going on here. 
So that is just to summarize where we are. That is an example of a Creative Commons situation where I think it's reasonably uh, trustworthy and safe to rely on this language because it's you know the source, um, we know who they are, and that they are making the decision to release things under Creative Commons. I'm a little more nervous when I see just random things on the internet identified as Creative Commons because I don't actually know um, or I'm not very confident in that designation because I don't know who made it and whether the original rights owner was involved. <laughs> Okay, so now we're up to another way of licensing images. Yes. Uh, something popped up in the... John Erickson, do you want to unmute and say what your mm, question is? Good question. Um, if a Creative Commons license says you must provide attribution and links to a license, um, is it sufficient to put it in credits at the end of a program? Or if you have a YouTube video with an image, can you put it in the description section or does it have to be accompanying the image? So that is a, that is a great question and an example of how some of these licenses haven't fully kind of thought through all of the potential use cases. Um, again, a risk management thing. I would take the position personally if it were me. I would say certainly for a YouTube video, putting it in the description section is more than enough or even in the credits of that video. I think that's totally fine. In a planetarium show, um, I think in the credits is okay. And then any um, written materials you may have, I don't know if, if there's you know, brochures or, or teacher's guides or things like that. Um, I would try to include the credits, you know, where, wherever you're including the credits, I would include the credit to that particular asset. Uh, but I, I think that's probably enough. And like I said, that's one of those things that they probably just haven't thought through and perhaps in a future version of the Creative Commons license, because they update them periodically, um, perhaps they'll, they'll take that into account. So follow up question from Rachel. What about using video music from YouTube if it's set so up as a- I think that's person. risky as well, although with one caveat, and that is if YouTube has identified the track, so it's sort of automatically, you usually see on some of these videos, it'll it'll be some, you know, some random person's video and then underneath it will say, you know, music, copyright, UMG, whatever, like Universal Music Group or some some sort of record label or music publisher. What's going on there is that video is uploaded and then automatically matched to a database of copyright assets that the record label or music publisher has provided YouTube. Um, it's unlikely that anything that's going through that matching process would be available under a CC license because they're usually commercial enterprises that, that sell things commercially. Um, so if it's that, I would be reasonably confident in the rights information that you have. If it's just somebody says the music is Creative Commons, um, I think you have the same risk that you have using the images from one of these search engines. It's just, we don't know that to be true. Um, and I, I actually, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just saw a complaint from a music publisher the other day, a production music library that was complaining that a number of their legitimate tracks um, had been um, misappropriated and were now in a Creative Commons library and they were not in fact Creative Commons. So it's the same thing I'm talking about with images and video uh, in the music space as well. And it looks like there's a clarifying point. Um, what about YouTube's music library? I'm actually not familiar with their library. Is it is it a database of music that they make available and they say it's all Creative Commons? So it's just a like a production music catalog. Rachel, you want to unmute? She says pretty much. Okay, yeah. Um, I think I, I don't know where that's sourced from. So if it's like YouTube has hired a bunch of composers to write music that their that YouTube uploaders can now include in their um, in their videos, then that's I would be more confident in that. If it's just, if it's sort of a crowdsourced thing, kind of like these image libraries I'm talking about, I'd be a little more concerned about it for the same reasons I just described. I'd just be careful. And you know, one way to check too is it, it's harder with images, I think, but with, with music, it might be a little uh, easier. If, if you know the name of the artist or composer um, is, is look them up and see if, and you can even ask them to say, was this, this was on YouTube as a, as a Creative Commons, is that correct? Right. And, and what they're doing there, just to get a little bit into the weeds in the, in the background of what they're up to, music um, you know, connects to the, the prior presentation about music. Uh, uh, music publishers and composers get paid for performance royalties when their music is performed. And so my guess is what YouTube is doing is suggesting that people include their light, their music as a Creative Commons uh, license, but then they're preserving the right to capture the back end revenue from performance. So every time that video gets played or that piece of music gets played in a video that's on YouTube, the, the various rights owners are getting paid on the back end for that. And so they're encouraging people to upload their music and make it available for quote unquote free um, because YouTube is paying performance royalties on that on the back end. 
So my guess is that's what's going on and it's probably reasonably safe. But again, I would just, I would use some, some diligence before using that music. All right, so I was talking about or getting to um, commercial stock libraries and you've all heard of these, right? Shutterstock, Alamea, um, iStock and Getty, the, the largest um, stock photo houses in, in the world. Shutterstock, uh, I think Shutterstock still independent. iStock is owned by Getty. Um, these guys, they, you know what they are. They're commercial stock libraries. You can search for images. They're right, they're licensed on either a rights managed basis or a royalty free basis. Rights managed means, you know, you know, I was describing earlier how you can carve up licenses. Rights managed means that it's a carved up license. So it says you can use this image for this particular use uh, for a certain period of time. And if you use it more than that, you have to pay extra. Whereas a royalty free image is where you download it and you, you get very, very broad usage rights. There are limits, but they're very, very broad. Um, and all of these guys now are in that royalty free. It used to be that royalty free was very sort of down market and photographers didn't want to be there. And the, the value for photographers was much lower. It's like pennies per image versus hundreds of dollars per image. Um, but the reality is the industry has, has turned so much towards uh, royalty free that all of the major stock houses provide uh, royalty free images now. And they're usually fairly cost effective. The cost to license one usually, you know, in the 15 to $30 range. And then the royalties on the back end aren't very good for the photographer, but um, the, the idea is they're making it up with volume. Uh, so that's, that's an example of kind of general commercial stock houses. There's also a number of specialty stock houses. This is one I'm familiar with called Fundamental Photographs out of New York. Um, as you can see there, they do very technically uh, intricate science related photos of, of you know, reactions and things happening. Uh, they take a tremendous amount of, of time and effort to get right and lighting conditions have to be good and probably lots of failed shots to get the, the, the hero shot. Um, these guys probably also license or license only on a rights managed basis. I, I include them just as an example of, you know, you can get a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of times when people hear stock images, they think of, you know, the cheesy images of random business people sitting around a conference room or handshakes isolated on a white background and things like that, things you see in, you know, corporate brochures and stuff. And it is a lot of that, but there are also these uh, very specialized stock photography services that, that provide um, really high-end images, and for a little bit of money, you can get some really, really good images. The reason why this is the safest way to go, if you're going to license images, and, and this is true for footage as well, is this portion of the license agreement that most of us just skip over and click I agree at the bottom. But this is the representations and warranties, part three there, and part four, indemnification and liability. And I'm not going to make you read all this, and I'm certainly not going to read it to you, but what's going on here is basically shutter this is from shutterstock they're basically saying we're standing behind the license we give you so if somebody comes forward if you use an image from us and somebody comes forward and says you're infringing my rights they will step in and defend the claim for you that's what indemnification means and you can see there are limits there it's not i think the monetary limit is in there it's not unlimited so it's it's not a perfect indemnity and if i were negotiating this deal on behalf of a big company i'd try to get more in there and it's that sort of thing but of all the things we've talked about, this is probably one of the safest ways to go because of this language. If you have a problem, you can call Shutterstock, you can call Getty, you can call iStock and say, somebody tells me I don't have any, a license for this, can you help me figure it out? And it may be that you overshot the terms of the license, right? You have certain, there are certain limits, that, as I say, they're very broad, but it could be that you did something you weren't supposed to do, in which case you're kind of on your own. But Again, very, very broad. If somebody, so, so that's not likely to happen, but if somebody comes forward and says, that's actually my image, it should never have been on Shutterstock, Shutterstock's gonna help you out, right? And that, that's what reps and warranties and indemnification are all about. And you're only gonna get those um, on these big commercial sites. It's a, a good way to think of this is the simple old adage of you get what you pay for. So if you're using free images and free stuff and you're not sure where it comes from, there's risk involved in that that you may end up paying you know, down the road for if it turns out you didn't have those correct rights versus licensing from the source at the, at the beginning um, and from somebody that's gonna stand behind it. You're, you know, yes, you're paying a little bit of money, but you're also getting the peace of mind that they're gonna stand behind um, any sort of infringement situation that might come up. <clears throat> Um, all right, specific to footage is this question that comes up all the time. Why can't I just use images uh, or uh, videos from YouTube? And the answer is, and you, you may, those of you who are in the music presentation or have watched that um, will recognize this because this is exactly the same slide. Um, it is because you can't use the service, the service is YouTube, uh, to view or listen to content other than for personal non-commercial use uh, 
and you can't, and then it specifically says you cannot publicly screen videos or stream music from the service. So remember back when I talked about what rights we need, one of them is public performance if we're going to present it in our theater. Um, and so because of that, and because the terms of YouTube that we all agree to by just using YouTube um, say that you can't do that, it's technically a violation of YouTube's license. Um, one thing you can do is go to the person who posted the video and see if you can figure out who owns it. And if they own it, you can negotiate with them for rights to include it in your show. Um, and if they don't, maybe they can help you find it, who, who owns it. But using things directly from YouTube um, is, is a little bit risky for this reason, right, in terms of use violation. <clears throat> okay, into the home stretch here. Um, this is just a, a heads up. I mentioned these casually earlier, and I want to spend a couple more minutes on them. There has been a recent uh, rise in organizations that are sometimes referred to as copyright trolls. In more polite society, they are known as copyright enforcement entities. And they are companies that have set up primarily looking for, uh, primarily in response to that business pressure I mentioned earlier. Photographers um, are getting kind of forced into this rights man rights uh, royalty-free world where the image, um, the, the amount they get per image is outrageously lower than it used to be. It's just harder to make a living. And then on top of that, the internet has just made it so easy to infringe that they're facing pressure for both sides. People are ripping them off because nobody cares about copyright on the internet and they're not making as much on legitimately licensed images because the market has changed. And so this, there's been this influx of companies that, that run around the internet searching for uses. They match those up with the known licensed uses that a photographer's provided them. And then they send a letter to the, the typically it's a website um, that's on which the unlicensed image appears and they demand a certain amount of money to settle the claim. And there are varying degrees of severity of these. There are some out there that are, there's, there's one lawyer out there who is well known um, to, to the courts and copyright lawyers as somebody who goes in and just sues. He doesn't send a letter. Like typically you get a letter that says, you know, they're usually fairly polite and they say, you know, you perhaps didn't realize what you're using this without a license and let's talk about a settlement, right? This guy just sued you. And then you find out about it when the process server shows up with the lawsuit. And then he tries to extract the settlement because he knows that litigating it's going to cost more than, um, than just settling it. And he can usually get a higher settlement because by then you're freaking out about having to get a lawyer involved and it just gets expensive. So you want to settle quickly. So that's kind of one extreme. At the other end are these polite letter writers that sort of say they're very polite in tone and they just say you're using this image without a license and we'd like to resolve this with you. Um, they sometimes don't even call it a settlement, they call it a retroactive license fee. Um, they're trying to be more sort of customer focused and, and, and try to engender some sense of you know, your willingness to, to pay that photographer down the road. Um, these guys are aggressive online. They haven't yet because they get, they build basically bots that go and crawl the web for, for infringements. And then they have automated backend systems that match those up and fire off you know, thousands of, of letters. So there's an economy of scale to it. They haven't figured out yet, as far as I'm aware, how to identify infringements in physical spaces. So I don't think you'll run the risk of getting a letter from one of these guys as a result of a planetarium show or a, um, a use in an exhibit. Having said that, I mean, it's not an excuse to go infringe people's copyrights. I'm just saying that if you're going to get these, it's going to be a web use almost certainly, um, particularly social media they're very aggressive on. Um, I guess my one piece of advice here is just don't panic. You can almost always negotiate with them. Um, a lot of them are very aggressive when you get them on the phone. It's typically because they're being handled by people who are paid on commission and they're not lawyers. They're just uh, the people that work for them. They're, they're claims resolution people whose job is to extract as much money as possible. So um, the way I tend to counsel clients when these things come up is I basically say, look, what would you have paid to license this? Let's offer them a little more than that. And the reason I say a little more than that is I call that the infringement premium. Um, you can't expect to pay market rates for something you shouldn't have been taking in the first place, shouldn't have been using in the first place. So it's kind of fair to offer them a bit more. But like I said, often they come in with these outrageously high demands and you can almost always talk them down a little bit. Uh, and then once again, I know it sounds like a broken record, but if you do get one of those letters or certainly if you get served with a lawsuit, absolutely talk to your own lawyer because especially if you get served with a lawsuit, there's very precise um, timing, like you have to respond to that in a certain number of days. Uh, and so if you don't, you could default and then it becomes a whole much more complicated scenario uh, and, and more expensive one. So absolutely turn that, that over uh, to your counsel immediately if you get something like that. And, and certainly if you get a letter like that, loop them in as well. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that. Here is my attempt at summarizing what we've just talked about. So you can see the various options down the left there in my rough um, three-point assessment of whether they, uh, or assessment on a three-point scale, of how risky they are. So you'll see there for 
public domain and using your own footage, those are pretty safe to use across the board, right? Because there's no, you either own the copyright or there's no copyright by definition for public domain. Use. Government works exception, I put sort of a use caution situation there because um, again, there may be a contractor involved that may own the rights and it may be subject to a license. So it's not saying don't rely on government works. It's just saying be aware that that exception may not apply based on the circumstances. So just be a little vigilant and figure out kind of, you know, do your due diligence to figure out whether what you're using is, is covered or not. Uh, we have the Teach Act next. That does not work for on-site exhibits or websites. Like I said, it has to be in a situation like a classroom or other place devoted to face-to-face -face teaching. I would be comfortable arguing that a planetarium theater counts. Um, some lawyers may not be that liberal. Um, again, talk to your own counsel, try to figure that out. But I, I would say that's a use caution and then doesn't work for the other two. Creative Commons and Unsplash and services like them um, or, or websites that purport to offer large databases of images licensed under Creative Commons or footage licensed under Creative Commons. Again, use caution, see if you can figure out where the image originates and confirm that it is actually available on a Creative, uh, creative Commons license. Commercial stock, generally safe across the board because of the reasons we described. They, know, they usually know who they're dealing with, um, they know who owns the copyright, and they stand behind it. So even if they're wrong, it's on them, it's not on you, which makes it a, a much simpler uh, situation. And then finally, YouTube, and we just talked about that, um, the, the terms of use, the, which is the license basically under which you can uh, use that content that's posted on YouTube is limited to personal use only. So it doesn't help us uh, in the planetarium environment. So um, that is all I have. So I appreciate your, your time. I see there's a couple questions in the chat box. So I, do you want me to, Alan, do you want me to handle those? Actually, uh, just uh, sure. for one second. Uh, if, if anybody else thinks this is as good as what I think it is, I would encourage you to unmute and show your appreciation with some applause, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we can go into those questions. There's a couple, couple of new ones that showed up in the chat. So the first one I see here is from Rosemary. Um, let me just give me a moment here to read this. Ah, good question. So, okay, so her question, I don't know if everybody's read this or not, but the, the question is, um, she has created material specific for use by her planetarium. That material is a combination of material she was given specific permission to use, so a license, and Creative Commons license with the share alike. She's never shared that material beyond her planetarium or outreach effort. Does the Creative Commons essay license uh, cause a problem? Um, I'm not an expert on the Creative Commons license language, but my instinct says it shouldn't be a problem um, because you haven't made, you, you, you're not not making it available. You just, the, the, the physical uh, copies are not available publicly. There's no mandate that you, you know, make copies of them. What you're sort of getting at is this doctrine in copyright called the first sale doctrine, which separates the physical work from the copyright. And what share alike is about is that the copyright interest in something is shared downstream. So if you were to make that available on the web, for example, as a PDF, um, you would under the share alike license, as I understand it, you would have to make that available for other people to share it. So in other words, if then I took your PDF and put it on my website, um, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it because I presume provided I'm also making it available under a share alike license. That's my understanding at least. And then your next part of that question is, if you work with a teacher for classroom material, does fair use kick in as a teacher? Um, it might. So that's a, that is, those are both fact-specific questions that are difficult to answer in the abstract because um, it just it sort of varies on the, the specific situations. Remember, fair use is, is very fact-specific. It's sort of hard to go through. Um, without knowing more about the material you're using and how you're using it, it would be tough to say. Um, let's see, Rick asks, what about requiring your students to watch a YouTube video and then take a quiz on its contents? Is that legal? Uh, yeah, I don't see any copyright reason why you can't do that. I, the only issue may be if certain students, for whatever reason, can't use YouTube or something like that, those sorts of issues. But yeah, there's no copyright issue there because you're not actually, you're not making a copy of, of the work or anything. Um, and you're not, you're not doing any, you're not engaging in any of those copyright rights uh, by just telling people to use a particular, um, to, to look at a particular video. Um, let me, okay, Drew, Drew, would you like to unmute and, artic and uh, ask about your YouTube question? Yes, thank you. Um, a lot of things are live stream now. I'll just use a NASA example or yep. a NRAO example 
an eclipse. Mm -hmm. Those are being live streamed on video because Google and YouTube have the best server farms around the world. I may or may not have a paying audience mm -hmm. in the dome watching a live streamed event on YouTube. Does that muddy the copyright question? Um, yeah, yes. And the reason it muddies it is I assume, so it's an interesting point. You're saying you're using YouTube for the, because that's the most reliable service available to use. Right. A lot of people use it now as a reliable way to stream. Right. Right. Um, it's a difficult question to answer because the technical answer is that you're bound by, everyone who uses YouTube is bound by those terms of service, um, technically. Uh, whether anyone's going to enforce them is a different question. So I, you know, and, and who's, you look at who's putting it up there. I get, I'd have to think more about it, but it could be that if that work is public domain to begin with, you can't, it, it becomes more of a question about your relationship with Google than it is your relationship with the copyright owner, right? Because it's Google that is applying those rules. When we use YouTube, and this is true for everybody, I've worked for some very big companies with YouTube, a uh, YouTube presence, everybody agrees to the same terms, you, me, big companies. So everyone in the YouTube ecosystem has agreed to follow those rules. Um, if we don't, so if like I, let's say we're streaming this on YouTube and I give you express permission to present it in your dome, um, is that technically violating YouTube's terms of service? I need to look more closely at them, but it could be, but I would also assert like, what's, what's the harm? So it's, again, it's one of those things where I can't really advise specifically. It's kind of, you'd have to talk to your lawyer to figure out kind of how you want to navigate that. But it does, it, it certainly, I mean, if your literal question was, does that muddy the waters? Yes, because because you've got la you've got multiple layers of ownership there. It's it's uh, or put differently, you have a copyright piece and then you have a contract piece, and the contract piece is the terms of service, but it relates to a copyright. And there's a bunch of complex law about whether you can get copyright damages from a breach of contract claim um, if it involves a copyright. So sorry, that's way more detail than you wanted, but um, that's it's it. Now you're basically telling us YouTube says yeah. you can't do it. So, so, so one, one thing, if you're ever on the other side of that, you're the one doing the streaming, um, I would look at some of the other services that are out there. And I don't know for sure what those terms say, but I know that for, you know, professional video, uh, you know, like uh, graphic artists and stuff that put their reels up on, on the web, most of them use Vimeo. And I don't know if that's because it just looks more professional and YouTube's kind of known as, you know, cat videos and, and K-pop stars and stuff. It, and maybe it's they're avoiding that, or it could be that there's just more robust terms of service. I haven't ever had occasion to dig into them. So it could be that there are other services out there that are now just as reliable that would get you around whatever, you know, muddiness. There, there are actually a lot of them, but mm -hmm. Google server, Google having server farms everywhere yeah. is pretty much the most reliable one. Yeah. They've got, they've got a lot of edges. So you get, you're all, you're yeah. never too far away from, from one of their servers. Yeah, I, I sorry that's not a, I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. And sorry that wasn't a super helpful answer, but hopefully it got you a little closer. All right. So ah, Steve has pointed out the photos of my uh, the photos are copyrighted. They are. And you nearly everything in this presentation, save a couple of the images in here that I took, are actually licensed from Shutterstock. So um, this, this one was a Shutterstock image. Um, although I live in LA, I am not that patient to get this shot. I thought it was a nice shot. But um, yes, they are all, I was, I'm glad actually you asked that. And I debated putting the credits on this thank you slide so that they're on the final thank you slide so that uh, uh, they would all be there. But um, yes, they are all, they are all properly licensed. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Mark. Appreciate that. And Jeff. Um, okay, so Rick asks, so if I post PDF PowerPoints which have non-commercial te teaching purpose only, and there are images from not from a stock agency, but just from Google, is that okay? PDFs post on the website. Um, I would, that, that it, it, it technically no, because you don't have a right to do that with the images. Um, the way most educators get around that is, or deal with that is by making them only available through some password protected service. And that's actually, one of the big sell points behind all these um, course management platforms like Blackboard and Canvas, um, all of that is uh, you know, password protected access control. You can, you can only be in a certain course uh, or you have to be in the course to get access to the course materials. And the reason for that, part of the reason for that, there's a lot of reasons, but part of it is 
um, if you can show that you've restricted access to the work, it gets it much, much closer to a fair use um, than, than you know, just putting it out on the internet for everyone to see. Uh, yeah, well, I, I do so much work in, in climate science and trying to get the real science out there that I feel if only a tiny number of students get to take advantage of my yeah. assembly of all this information, it's like, why, why should I work so hard? Um, so, so that's kind of depressing to hear. Well, so what you could do, I don't know what these, um, these images are that, that are in there that you're getting, but if, if they're of, um, you know, if they're from scientific papers and things, you might check the, uh, the, li the language. There may be some licensing language in the document because a lot of those that are prepared pursuant to federal grants um, carry very broad uh, like rights um, grants to, to downstream users. So I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're using or if they're just like random images. Um, well, both. But um, I would say I, I, I don't, I don't, um, well, so my college doesn't subscribe to uh, these expensive journals. And so whatever papers that I read and get images off of, they're, they're freely available on the web. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that makes a difference or not. I've, I'm I, not you're, really you're, worried about copyrights, frankly. You're in the classic sort of conundrum where, um, you know, it's, it's a technical, you technically would need to license that, but it, it's possible that, you know, the likelihood of an enforcement action is relatively low given the context. Um, but it's, it's a case by case thing that you have to look at. And there may be, I mean, if it's academic and it's being provided, you know, you're using small portions of things and you're like, there may well be a fair use argument there as well. Um, it's tough to say without looking at them and actually, you know, kind of digging in. But so, so there may be some ways around it, but I just meant to suggest that the, the, re, the way most schools get around that issue is by limiting things to a small group. But I take your point that in your situation, the whole point is to not limit it to a specific group. So I, I definitely hear your, uh, your, feel your pain. And your Chris, Chris, I think there's one more question, but before, before we take that question, I wanna remind people or, or say to people who came in late, you know, there's several people who came in late that um, we're signing in through the chat. So if you just put your name uh, and where you're from is interesting for us to see, you know, what, you know, where your location is <clears throat> in general. Um, that would be good just for the record. Um, but, and, and again, Chris, this is amazing. It's uh, been, been really, really, really good. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Um, so it looks like our last question is, uh, or the last one so far is uh, virtual field trips using Zoom as private presentations, not recorded. What are the limitations? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't think if it's not being recorded, it's not being fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So the um, there, there's you're not creating a copyrighted work. And I would su submit that what you're looking at on the screen or showing people on the screen you know, it might be subject to copyright protection, but it's probably only fleeting. So if you're like doing a tour of something and there's a copyrighted artwork behind the scenes, you know, we worry about that in the media industry where it's going to be blasted out to, you know, millions of people. Um, so that's, you know, on a, on a set, you'll make sure that everything has been properly, you know, licensed and everything down to the art on the wall and everything. Um, in your situation, it doesn't sound like any of that's likely present. So that seems fairly low risk to me. Again, caveat that without knowing all the facts, it's difficult to say, but um, that feels fairly low risk to me. Thank you, Chris. This is a, uh, we, we have permission to post this video in the archive now you from do. the source. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, uh, one last round of applause if you, you know, whoever wants to unmute and show their appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is, uh, I enjoy doing this. I am, I am in awe of the number of people that joined. So thank you all for spending a little bit of your Friday afternoon or evening uh, with me. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Have a nice evening, everybody, or wherever you are. <laughs> all right. Have a good weekend. Have a good one. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>